Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I, I would ask that if you can move up so you can, you can hear me. Uh, before we start uh, my talk on ancient religions and government, in the present day Kitri. Uh, let me explain two things. One is that history in Tonte, I argue, is not something you write down and put it on the shelf. It's part of our tradition. It is a way of life. So I will begin by saying, Kraki Meipa. That is, what I'm about to say is not straight, and those of you who know more should make it straight. But this is a true confession. You cannot know every detail of history yourself. Therefore, I'm asking for those who know more to either extend it or to make it better. But there's another say, every time you tell a story in Pompeii, you say, I say what? What does that mean? That means my story is carried forward. And those are two good ingredients in the history of Pompeii, or when you tell the history of Pompeii. You want the story to be carried forward, but at the same time you confess that what you say will not be everything. Uh, and those of you who know more should make it better. So there will be a lot of references here, and even in the manuscript there, to oral histories. So I would like to show you some of the resources that are used uh, to put together the manuscript that you see. So during the 19, early 1900s, um, German ethnographer was in Pompeii doing some studies, and he published his work in 1932 and 1936. He collected oral histories from historians or oral historians. Uh, there is a lot of them. This is the list. And you can see Nolan Bernard is on top of the list. And he provided Pembroke with about 100 narratives about Pompeii. And there are two brothers who were also uh, very instrumental in the oral histories of Pompeii. They are Luis Kio and Warren Kio. They're from Madrenim. They, they contributed a great deal. But you can see that uh, there is, how many of them did you count? Uh, the list continue here. Uh, I list down the oral historian and also their plan and where they came from. This was the result of a study I did that led up to my uh, thesis, dissertation. Okay, next. Then, uh, maybe before I go on, how many of you are from Kitri? You are all from Kitri. You are from Kitri? You can raise your hand. Only one, two, three. Okay, the reason why I'm asking is I will be verifying certain things from you. When I talk about the political history of Kitchen, uh, I would like to make sure that you can confirm that what I'm talking about is correct. So, anyway, how many of you are members of the Tubunwai clan? So there's one there. What about Tubula? Two. No, Tupulak, what about Little Chan? No? Well, you can see that here I organized the storytellers by clan. And of course, the Bunwai was on top, and they contributed about 132 individual narratives about Pompey. Uh, Tupulak came next, and then Little Chan came next, and then you have the rest of them. Now what is this telling us? You are a member of the Tupunwai, right? That is telling us that the members of the Tupunwai 
tend to be oral historians of Pompeii, right? But these stories were collected during the turn of the century. So I think it's a good way of organizing what do you mean by oral history. So when I started talking about oral histories, these are some of the contributors to my knowledge of the oral history. Thanks. Okay, we will continue, but what I will start with is a discussion on the chronology of Pompeii and some generalizations that we need to understand or at least know for now. And then we will move on to Kitty prior to the Narmarka period. And you're looking here at what I think was happening prior to the Narmarka period. Kitty was made up of uh, four areas. You have Palam, you have Trapilang or Kitty, you have Nolang, and then you have Salapu. There was no Kitty prior to the pre narmarki period. The area called Kapilang was known as Kitty. And when the area was unified, they adopted the name Kitty as the name of the municipality, and we're using that up until now. But uh, before we go on to political history of Kitty, we know from the archaeological record and from the oral histories that the centuries from 1080 to 1580, that's a 500 year period, from the archaeological record we know that the use of pottery decreased and disappeared eventually. And then the major structures of Nanmadol were constructed at this time. We know that Nanmadol became a center of influence under the South Dalil leadership during this period of time. We assume, based on certain studies, that the population was very large at that time, possibly 50,000 people or more. How many people are in Pompeii now? Does anybody know? What is the current population in Pompeii? Okay. Hey. Okay. Huh? I don't know either, so don't feel bad about it. Yes? Near 36,000. Yes. It's around 36,000. And if you think of 50,000 at that time, that's quite a lot. And that estimate came from our study of Nanmadol. We uh, identify certain house platforms on a certain number of islands. And based on an assumed number of people that each household had, we calculated that all of Nanmadol could have been occupied at one point by 2,000 people. So extrapolating from 2,000 people at Nanmadol at that time, it's reasonable to assume that the population of Pompey at that time was close to around 50,000 people. So that's a large population and that enabled some public projects to be done and you have the stylized tomb that we call Dolong today. I think it emerged at this time period. We know for sure from radiocarbon dates that the structure Nandawas, Panui, Ambatra, Nanmalusai, and Karyan were built around the 1200 AD. So we also know from investigating some of the structures that some of the structures were extended in time. Uh, that is Usentao. Uh, we know one side of the wall was very, very old. And then another side was very recent. So that's an expansion of the structures in time. And we think that the expansion occurred between uh, about 1300, uh, 12 to 1380. So, what happened toward the end of this period, let's say 1300 to 1600 AD, Pompey saw the downfall of the South Dolor era. Uh, we know of the Sokolokal coming to conquer Nanmadol, and that's the beginning of the period of the 
Lamarckist era. Lamadol was observed during the 1700s, and the, observer, the observers indicated that it was already in Rome. So, but we assume that probably uh, around 1800, uh, around 1500 AD, Lamadol was beginning to, uh, to, to be abandoned. We don't really know for what reason. And then, at about the same time, according to oral histories, you have a new order, a new political and religious order that came into being in Pompeii. So this is the decentralization of the South Alone dynasty. So the emergence of Denmark period in general, can anybody tell me which is the first municipality that has Denmark? Is it Sokes or Net or Madelenium or where? Who is from Madelenium? All right, so you tell us. Uh, of course, I, and I'm glad uh, that we don't, we, we have yet to study this. Now, uh, Madelenium came as the first Denmark municipality. How many of you know the story of Nitrogen Madelenium? Or, uh, <laughs> well, let me not tell you the story. But, uh, uh, one of the Nanmarkis of Medlinium, I think as early as he's over, one of the sons, uh, something happened, and he came down to Wanip, and he started Wu, as a Nanmarki of Wu. And this son was a member of the La Siala clan, right? So the Nanmarki of Wu is what clan? La Siala, what about the Nanmarki of Medlinium? To win by was a member of what? Cory Zogalagal was a member of the Wind But that's where nitrogen methylenium comes in. Because Zogalagal cannot carry on the Wind all the way. It has to be through the uh, through the line, through the female line. And therefore Zogalagal's sister was the one who started the um, the Namargis of Madalenium that carry on. But, but you can see that in the story of the uh, nitrogen methylenic. I'm not going to tell you the story at this point. Anyway, what about Sokes and Nut? When were the Narmarkis bestowed in Sokes and Nut? During the German period? During the Japanese period? During the Spanish period? Which one is right? And our Marquis of Sokes and Madani were bestowed during the Japanese period, very recent. Prior to the Japanese period, who was the leader of Nut? What was the title? That was Lepen Nut. And so it becomes a tandem title, the Namarki of Nut, up until now. What about Sokes? Who was the Namarki of Sokes prior to Japanese period? That was Wasaiso, or a person who was, who was uh, second in rank. And so the Namargi of Sokes has the tandem title of Namta. When you refer to the Wasais of uh, Donpe, you can also you can also say Namta. But the Namargi of Sokes has the uh, tandem title. So, you know that the formation of the five municipality occurred over time and it began with the Namargi of Madrenium, second came Wanit, the Namargi of Wu, uh, third came the Namargi of Kichi, and then fourth the Namargi of Sokes, and the last one was Namargi of Nut. Why is this important? When you stand up to say something, and all of the Namargis were there, who is going to begin? of uh, We continue to hold some of the references to uh, the old practices, and I think it's a good thing. So, can anybody tell me something else about what I just indicated?
general trends in Colombia, based on what I said. You know, our political system changed through time, but it continues now. What would you expect our five municipalities to become in the future if this traditional political system continues? Does anybody have any ideas? Okay, I do suspect that as the population changes, then you can have an additional municipality or something thereof. This has not really occurred. But it is possible that you will have a new municipality and then you will have a new landmark in the future if our political system continues. And something that you have to think about is when was the imposition of the Western political system onto our political system? And I think it's a good research paper for all of you to find out in time and also to find out the differences between the traditional political system and also the modern political systems. Who can tell me what are our modern political system? What, what kind of government do we have? Do we have a monarchy? The monarchy is monarchy system. What about what do we have now? Democracy. Yeah? Democracy. Democracy, right. We have constitutional governments as it is now. All of us have constitutions, right? What is the difference between our monarchy system or what you may want to call monarchy system and then the constitutional system? So I will just pose that question to you to answer. The important thing that you should remember is that we have a continuing traditional political system and I would like to see that continue but for now uh, the mechanics of that system is eroded. Many of you are not very keen on, you know, no poya, and law, and having sakka, and free, and all of that. So, uh, your generation may have the political system change and or otherwise die. It may die with us. Let me turn our attention to I think along these trends, Kitty more likely between 1400 AD and 1600 AD, I will call that a pre nanmarkic period. We have the four areas that I indicated before as making up Kitty. Palam, who is the leader of Palam? Navadaman Palam, right? What clan? Yeah, he is the Puntaga. And the government that he led was what I term a secular one. It's not a religious political system or religio political, however you want to call it. Okay, another name for Palang at this time was Lenpoint. I don't know why it was called Lenpoint. Maybe because it was muddy. Yeah, and another area was Kapilang or what is referred to today as Kiti. Kiti was really a smaller section of today. It's referred to before as Kapilang. And who is the leader of that? So Kiti, you're right. He was a member of the Gunman Tantan. And again, his government was more secular than religious. Then you have an Olam. What is an Olam? What part of Kiti? Eastern part of Kiji. Who is from Wana? No one was here. Okay. The area referred to as Wana was called Lung. Uh, so Oksar Lung was the leader. He was a member of the Tibunman clan. He led a government that is more religious and secular in a sense. Religion is sense that Saukisar Lung was a priest. He was referred to as a Samaro. Right? Mm -hmm. So Gita was never referred to as a Samara in the oral histories. And so is Namadan Palam was never referred to as a religious leader. Or... And then you have Salapuk. And the head of the Salapuk region was Somalang. 
He was a member of the Song Kawat clan. I want you to note now that you have the Bunman as member as the leadership clan of Kapilang or Kichi and also as leadership clan of Panola. Right? Right? Any questions on this? I know some of you, that's why I put up the chart about oral histories, because these are all based on stories recounted by our oral historians. Somebody has to write some history of, of our island. And if it's going to be based on oral histories, so be it. But we should have a history. We should have a history that we know and that we're proud of. See, we're, we don't really know, and I don't really know until now, that the, the political development in Pompeii was very, very complex in the past. You go from one leader to decentralization, you have five leaders now, and even within the five leaders there are different type of leadership. There are areas where religious aspect of the leaders are emphasized, and there are areas where secular, more non-religious type of things were. Right? So Salabuk was known as the seat of the high priest Somulang. Onolang was the seat of the high priest Soksolang. By the way, what is the tandem title for the Namarki of Kitty? Soksolang. Okay, this is carried over from, from the past. Right? So the high, high priest of all of Pompeii, there is some indication that Somulang was not only a priest leader of Kichi, but he was also known throughout Pompeii. So he was, in some of our histories, considered as the high priest of all of Pompeii. He has some ceremonial rituals, so people who assisted him, and they, are, they are considered lower priests. I'll read out some of the names. But if you're interested, you can look in the book. So you have Aulukilam. The title is still bestowed today. He was considered to be a ritual specialist or high priest during the uh, Soma Nang's era. Uh, then you have Kronai. The title is also bestowed today. Kronai was the keeper of the drums, and I'm not quite sure what the function of the drums are. We know there is a term for drum, ait, uh, but we don't really know what the function are today. But they probably were used for uh, a message from one group to another, probably a musical instrument. Then you have the secular assistant as Maniak Soko, and Manin Kautak was a prayer specialist. Kei was responsible for preparation of ritual kappa. Uh, Sabadan Paniso, you have Kei Chapur. Uh, two very important ones, because they, they continue to carry significant affiliations with the, the old Salapu connection. Who knows who is the section title of Anmant today? Uh, the title is called Kasa, even now. Now, Kasa was a priestly title during the uh, the time of the high priest of Salapuk, that is. And he was a keeper and manager of a sacred stone bowl known as Langina. And this one is located in Pain Kararawa. That's within Saptakai itself. Well, he was supposed to ensure the economic prosperity and distribution of resources on the eastern part of Kiti, but not to Onola. 
just on certain areas of the world. And then we have Ruan and Putoy. Who is Ruan and Putoy today? He is a section chief or Samazan goes up of what section? Putoy. Putoy. Right. So he was another priestly title under Somala. And he was responsible for a sacred stone ball called Man Lai Cake or Long Kutar. You may hear about Long Kutar in certain areas. And he was responsible for the resource distribution and uh, economic prosperity of the western part of Kitchen. Now these are important because today these two titles have become very secular. They are no longer they are political leaders of Putoi and political leaders of Nanma. There is no implication that they were priestly titles before. And their responsibilities, of course, shift from more of the ritual specialists, probably praying for resources and whatnot, more or less to what some of them goes up are doing now. By the way, what 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 are the responsibilities of the Samazan Kosap today? Well, one of the major responsibilities is to make sure that they announce the time of Kamat Wo to the people and they make sure that the contributions by the Kosap members are you know, prepared and at the end of the year given to the non market in honor of the non market But through time, you know, through this, we know that uh, their function or what they did was quite different in the past. So rituals in Salabuk were performed for, I think, two major reasons. One is to announce productivity of the land. The second was to announce the protection of the people from natural catastrophes. I was work working there in 1989, 90s, and the people of Salabuk told me that the last performance to protect the people from typhoon occurred during the early part of the 1900s. And what happened was the ritual specialists prayed for, you know, the prevention of that catastrophe. It didn't occur. So he decided to just took his title and returned it to some saying this thing doesn't work anymore. And that marked probably the last of the people who served as priest and decided to keep up his position this didn't work. Uh, there is another major priest festival that occurred there called Kauru. But we don't really know what transpired at that time. So the oral history doesn't give you a detailed account of that. But let me move on to Onorlam. We'll talk about Salapu. And I will talk about Onorlam. The Onorlam, I think the settlement of Onorlam from Radio Garvan dates go back to about AD 500. But we don't really know the emergence, date for the emergence of Sok Salam process, political process. Uh, oral histories clearly indicated that uh, Sok Salam was a high priest as well as a political secular, secular leader. We like uh, Somulang in Salapu. Somulang was assisted by lower priests, uh, people that assisted him in the ritual and ceremonies. Sawana was one of them, Matawana, Kronana, Somulang was one. Sapatan Ronan Tang. Pasangan Lang was another lower priest title. He was apparently responsible for sacrificial rituals. And then Sapo, Luan Sapit, and Kota. These were listed as lower priests under uh, Soksan Lang. Uh, rituals similar to Salapu were conducted to ensure land productivity and to ensure the well-being of the people, very similar to Salapu. 
and then main prayer and ritual activities were performed at a site called Haler. This site is located in Olaba, on Kitri. Now this is kind of suspect. It's apparently one of the major ceremonies called Pongen Kasata was scheduled for seven days. Seven days of the week was set aside, set aside for the various performances of this, uh, this major ceremony. Why, why do I say that it's a suspect? I'm not quite sure how Christianity influenced this, but the seven days is a little, little bit suspect on my part, maybe. Um, and then there, there are two important stones in Anola, similar to so, uh, Salapu. One of them is called Langapap. Uh, the stone is used for protection of bountiful reasons, that is, they probably pray and do some of the things at this stone to ensure that you have a good season so food crops. And then the other one is called Waneros. Uh, Waneros is a little bit long. It is a stone that is supposed to tell uh, the end of Wene. You know, I, I'm not quite sure what the end of Wene region will be. Um, anyway, the story goes that both stones and also Palier. Palier we know for sure that it was destroyed during the early 1900s. And then the two stones were stolen sometimes and we cannot find them now. You know, one of the ways that the heroes of Tonpei did things in the past was to go and steal something that is of value from a region and bring it to another area of, of Tonpei. Apparently when you do that, it brings certain strength, power from one region to another. And this can cause anomalies in the titles that are in stone. Like in my area, there is a stone that is placed in one of the platforms, sacred platforms in there. The stone was apparently stolen from Wapa. It was used during the latter part of Nanmarki, Pistowal of the Nanmarki in Madlani. And the stone was used to, you, know, you, you try to strike the Nanmarki or the new ones. And if he blinks, that means his era will be very short. His time for leadership will be short. If he doesn't, then he will have a long last time. Anyway, the stone was stolen from there by an unpaying. Hey, that's too bad. There are not that many people. So they can confirm some of these stories. Uh, unpaying cultural hero known as Isha Saul. He stole that stone from Wapar, took it to when it, Songrong put it in a pay and he promised them from now on the Namarkis of Madrani will be from your area. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of the Namarkis of Madrani talk like people from Kitchi. Mm -hmm. And it seems, you know, it seems like maybe this guy is accurate in his projection. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you steal one important thing from one place, you place it in another to allow for certain good fortune, for certain things to happen in the region. Um, any questions so far, I think? Uh, I will uh, stop here. Anolang and Salapuk were religious and secular. They have religious leaders in the past. Hence the title of the book, Religions and what? Government. Uh, in the kitchen. Let me move on quickly to Baram and Saptakai. Does anybody, uh, who is from Kitchi here to raise your hand again? You are all from Kitchi, mm -hmm. three of you. What, what happened in Saptakai in the past? You know? Mm -hmm. Okay, remember, uh, Namadan Balam was a member of what? Tugun Baba. 
And Saukaji was a member of Tubanman, right? When Amadan Palang was not a good leader, he started conquering land from Palang all the way to Sapchaka, all the way to Kiti. And he did conquer Kiti at some point and became the leader of Saukaji. Okay, when that happened, the first conquering of Saptakai was referred to as Saptakai War Number One. This is my designation. You don't have to follow. And then Saukzalang was a member of the Tubunman, right? So Saukzalang decided to avenge the members of, of the uh, Tubunman at Saptakai who were conquered by Tubunman. So organized a group. They came down and invaded Saptaka. It's generally what happened. And I refer to the second invasion as Saptaka number two war. Okay, when that happened, a group from NET, probably some alliance of Soksalam, decided they were going to go and help Soksalam. So they went from NET all the way to Kitty. But Zoksalam told them, you go and wait for me at Sapta, not Sapta, uh, that little island in Tolitu. Uh, so the people from that went over and waited for Zoksalam Tolitu. Meanwhile, Zoksalam and his warriors did not go there. They went on land and fought at Sapta and conquered Sapta after this was done, then they went out to Tolotip and informed the people from NET that they have done what is needed. They have waged war and conquered uh, uh, Saptrakai. Who was the leader of Saptrakai? You remember? Mm -hmm. I mentioned this before. It was Sokiti, right? Yeah. The leader of Saptrakai was Sokiti. So what happened was Sauksarla awarded the people of Nut for their intention to help him. And they gave him the title Saukiti. So for a long time, Saukiti title was bestowed, being bestowed in Nut up until the time of Namarki Sekis Mundo. This is 1930s <coughs> or 1940s. So Namarki Sekis Mundo came and helped the people of Nut, killed one of the Spanish governors. And he said, I will do this on the condition that you give me Saukiti, the title of Saukiti, so I can return it to unpaid, to get it. And that's what happened. Now Marquis Sagismundo helped the people of Nut. The people of Nut gave him the title Saukiti, and he returned it to Kitchen. So what's happening in that? Saukiti is still being bestowed, right? But it's no longer Saukiti only. It is Saukiti Nut. That's the title that is being bestowed. The actual Saukiti was returned to Kitchen. And now it is, I think, Luis Santos is now the Saukiti. Kitchen. That's the story of the Second Saptakai War. What are, what are some of the consequences of the Saptakai War? Number one, Kiju was unified after that war, but Salapuk remained an independent area. So you have Bala, you have Kiju, and you have Onolong unified, and they bestowed the first Nanmarki on one of the Saptakai and and then there is a Libertad man who is a war hero during the Second Saptakai War. Because of his deed during the war, they gave him the title Nanakai. So you have Namarki of Kitri remain as the Winman, and the Nanakai of Kitri uh, was given to the members of the Libertad clan uh, in Kitri. Uh, let me see what okay, there are uh, for now. Certain areas of Palam that you can recognize now. The subdivision of Palam, independent at one time, 
you have Balam Tian Nan Payes are now part of the previous Balam area. Next one. Uh, then the Kok or Kichi area is comprised of Pok, Kupar, Rong Kichi, Samoy, Anpenpa, and Anpenpo. Now this is the Kok region. The Kok region was never developed into an independent area. There are still oral historians and people who claim that the Likop area was a different section in the past. Next one. Okay, the subdivisions of Kitchi, remember Sapsatan? Kitchi. Included Poi Poi, Nanman, Wanak, Lawatip, Ore, Yati, Patrapata Laos, Sawiza, Balia Bailo, Marao, and Jamoralo. These are recent concepts that comprise that comprise the Kitchi. One point. Other way than you, for that? No, no, previous. Why, boy, that man, one Okay, who is the section chief of Lawatuk? Si. Yeah, si. Si for Lawatuk, right? So there were two brothers, students from Pompey, who were, one was questioning the other. One asked, who is the Samozan Kosa of Lavatu? So the other one said, Sip for Lavatu. But then he asked, but the, who is the Samozan Kosa of Seluan? So the other guy, you know, tried to remember, he couldn't really think of what. So he said, uh, yeah, go to Seluan. So <laughs> if Lavatu has got a section chief of Sip for Lavatu, then it follows that Sainwar must be go to Sainwar. <laughs> uh, anyway, no one took his point. Next one. Uh, then subdivision. So, what is this? Yes. You have what? You have Pasa. Oh no, you go rent to Mutok, Sangrom. What up on Borasa? What up on Mokut? What happens through time, and this has been proven in Awak, there was a study done by an ethnographer by the name of Glenn Peterson. His argument was that any section that becomes overpopulated through time will tend to have a fissioning occur, or a part would be broken away and they started a new section. So some of these areas, I think, through time, started having this uh, fishing process that caused sections after sections to develop through time. Any more? OK, I, I just wanted to explain this a little bit. At Long, at the time that we were talking about Soksha Long, there was another religion that occurred there. Uh, they worship what is called Ilake, a year. Uh, so, offshoot of this worship, a leader started to organize the secular leaders, started to organize the, what you call, section leaders, almost like Somas and Kosa. And they became one line of, of the leadership. And so Lang's priest became another line. So you have two lines. And this is the seating arrangement that was uh, information on this was obtained by Hamburg anyway. I always wonder about Mungin to Briyal and the two leadership within the Nas today. You have the Nanamarkis sitting up there on one side, you have the Nanakin sitting on another side. I don't think anybody has tried to do some research on the beginnings of this. And I'm, I'm inclined to believe that because of this practice, separating the secular leaders of Nola under the Ilaka religious practices and uh, more of the priest group into two areas, and they have their seat arrangement in this way. It could possibly the beginning of the NAS or the arrangement of the Namaki and the Namaki. Just 
wanted to throw this in. Anyway, that, that's the end. And that's all I can say for now. And if you're interested, you can, you can look at the manuscript now. It's called Religion and the Government of Kitchen. I think it is good work. Uh, it remains as an, a manuscript, not published. Yeah, and I wish to review that and see if I can add more. Uh, more